So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to the session on Collaborate to Accelerate, Innovating Future-Focused Water Security. My name is Alison Woodruff, and I'll be your moderator for the session today. <clears throat> so sorry, just to set the scene, um, the water sector in Asia and Pacific, it's facing increasingly complex uh, challenges driven by factors including climate change, rapid unplanned urban development, resulting in increasing demands for water for drinking, for food and energy production and economic development. Innovation is a must for the water sector to cope with these challenges. Overcoming these challenges and spurring innovation uh, requires stakeholders to work together in new ways using new approaches and technologies. Globally, partnerships constitute a vital instrument in the international development architecture. This stems from the realization that to succeed uh, develop in development efforts, um, this requires effective cooperation across institutions, governments, international agencies, the private sector and civil society. Expanding the role of various actors engaging in partnerships is pivotal to exchange ideas, technical expertise and financial resources necessary for accelerating progress on the sustainable, sustainable development goals, namely Sustainable Development Gold 6, Water for All. So to discuss these topics today, um, we have a great lineup of distinguished speakers. We have Jeff Wilson, who's a senior water resources specialist from the Asian Development Bank. We have uh, Mr. Therawat Sampha Wamana, who's director for, of the planning division with the Mekong River Secret Commission Secretariat. We have Sarah Ransom, general manager from the Australian Water Partnership. Laurence Charles Tremblay Levesque, uh, IWRM and Knowledge Management Specialist, Network Specialist for China and South Asia, and uh, Ms. Yumiko, uh, Dr. Yumiko Yasuda, Senior ne Network and Transboundary Water Cooperation Specialist, Thematic Lead on Transboundary Water Cooperation, and Network Specialist for Caribbean, Southeast Asia, Pan and Pan Asia, both from the Global Water Partnership. And finally, we have Anne-Marie Martin from a senior water associate with Imagine H2O. So to kick off the session, I would first like to invite Mr. Satoshi Ichi, Director for Strategy and Partnerships in ADB's Water and Urban Development Sector Office uh, to give opening remarks. So over to you, Satoshi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, collaborative partners and participants, uh, good morning from Stockholm. Uh, I, I'm Satoshi Shi, the Director of Strategy and Partnerships, ADB Water and Urban Sector Office. It is with a great pleasure that I welcome you to all this session, focusing on the theme, Collaborate to Innovate within the water sector. Today, we gather to embark on a collective journey that promises to reshape the way we approach one of the most critical challenges in our time, the sustainable management and conservation of our planet's most precious resource, which is water. In a world confronted in increasingly complex, interrelated challenges, it has become very clear that traditional siloed approach are no longer sufficient to address the multi-faceted issues surrounding water security. A water sector, a vital artery that sustains life, agriculture, industry, and ecosystem stands at crossroad. Rapid urbanization, population growth, climate change, and evolving socioeconomic dynamics have propelled water-related challenges to the forefront of global discourse. It is not merely an issue of environmental concern. It is an issue that holds profound implications for the prosperity, inclusiveness, resilience, and sustainability of human well-being. Today's session, Collaborate to Innovate, seeks to serve as a catalyst for change, inspiring a paradigm shift that crosses boundaries and bridges the gap. It is a call to the multi st multiple stakeholders, government agencies, regulators, the private sector, finance, pro finance providers like ADB, and of course, uh, local and traditional communities to unite in a common purpose. Our aim is to foster an ecosystem of shared insight, collaborative solution, and that drive the much needed transformation of the water sector. In this session, uh, we are the privilege of learning from those who have already set in motion transformative collaborations uh, within the water sector. 
we will explore some of the practices and underpin successful multi-stakeholder collaboration. We will uncover the essential elements that cultivate an environment of trust, transparency, and open dialogue. So the innovating innovation can flourish. Okay. Through interactive discussions, case study, and expert insights, we will learn the benefits that collaborative approaches can impart to the water sector. In closing, I extended my heartfelt gratitude to everyone, you, every one of you who joined in this session. Your participation underscores your commitment of effective positive change and shaping a more sustainable, humanious world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satoshi. So before we um, start uh, the presentation from our first speaker, we thought we to try and make this session inter interactive, we, we want to hear from you. So we have a Mentimeter poll with a couple of questions to ask you. If you could please uh, follow the link and enter the code or use the QR code listed on this slide, um, you'll be able to participate in the poll. So we'll just give a few more seconds for you ha to have an opportunity to, to log in to Mentimeter to join our, our voting. Okay, so for our first question for our audience poll, when it comes to collaboration in the water sector, what word or short phrase immediately comes to mind? And we're getting some, some responses already. Partnership, yeah. Let's see what other uh, words come to the audience's mind as we mull over this question. Great, seeing questions around multi-stakeholder, collaboration, integration, leadership, together. Some people think conflict, <laughs> interesting one. A um, lot of good responses, actionable. Cross-disciplinary, that's a, a good one, exciting. Right. Maybe we'll just give a, give a couple more seconds to, to allow people, those who want to vote, to, to vote before we move on to the next question. But uh, great to have active uh, engagement and some good responses. I think it looks like, yeah, let's move on to our next question. If we say that collaboration leads to better outcomes, then what word or short phrase do you regard as better? So what would you regard as better when it comes to collaboration? Seeing some good results around equity, results, measurable, commitments, inclusive, Commitment, these are great, great responses from the from the audience. Nature led, sharing, sustainable. Fantastic. Okay. I think uh we we had some really great um responses from the audience and uh Hopefully um, you'll hear some of you, what you see as being better outcomes reflected in the, in the session presentations today. So without further ado, uh, please let me uh, introduce Jeff Wilson, who will be presenting on collaboration and partnership with ADB. So over to you, Jeff, thank you. Thanks a lot, Alison. Um, I hope you can hear me, good morning. Good morning from uh, Stockholm. My name is Jeff Wilson. I'm a senior water resources specialist at the Asian Development Bank. And since this session is all about collaborate to accelerate, let's start by viewing some of the partners in the partner ecosystem who we should be collaborating with. Uh, next slide, please, Eileen. 
So there are many, many stakeholders with uh, vested interest in the water sector, and most of these are outlined here. Uh, the water service providers face a difficult job delivering water under limited financial resources and many other constraints. And there's a large partner ecosystem surrounding them. You only have to attend Stockholm World Water Week to see that the vast and the varied stakeholders and they all want a voice. So <clears throat> we all want to see improvements in water service delivery, whether that be in efficiency or compliance or 24-7 water or lower tariffs. And the best way to address the, the many issues which affect us all is to collaborate with all the players of the water service provider ecosystem, whether they be startups, the universities, the customers, and the finance providers. And yes, even the finance providers like ADB. We are always looking for innovative ways to collaborate and innovative ways to support the water service providers. So surely if we can combine our thinking on the many issues facing water service providers, then all kinds of new solutions may arise. Next slide, Gino, thanks. So this is one of the reasons why ADB developed the Water Resilience Hub. So the Water Resilience Hub is an open platform, open to everybody, uh, dedicated to strengthening water security in Asia and the Pacific region by establishing partnerships, by providing training and opportunities, and developing and sharing knowledge products, innovative methodologies, tools, data, digital technologies. The aim of the hub is to assist water service providers in finding solutions for resilient water systems and to embark towards a resilient pathway. We have given the hub the tagline, connect, collaborate, and capacitate. And that is exactly what it's intended to do. So it's a one-stop shop for ADB's capacity building in the water sector, for ADB staff, for our partner implementing and executing agencies, and for anyone else with a vested interest in the water sector. So we invite you to join the hub, either as an individual or as an organization. Next slide, please, Gino. Thank you. Other ways ADB has been collaborating with the water sector is through digitalization, our e-marketplace, and through our twinning partnerships. The adoption of digital technology has been frustratingly slow in the water sector. We believe digitalization can be a great connector and is a huge untapped opportunity to build resilience. As an example, ADB is collaborating with Imagine H2O Asia. They are a nonprofit based organization based in Singapore. Um, and we're implementing the Accelerating Innovation and Digitalization Program, which we call the AID Program. AID aims to upskill ADB staff and our counterpart implementing and executing agencies to evaluate and uptake innovation and digital transformation. The program encompasses training, solution matching, pilot testing support, and knowledge sharing. Under AID, Imagine H2O engages with startups to bring innovation opportunities from the private sector into ADB projects. And to date, we have two uh, potential pilot opportunities, one with water ATMs in Bangladesh and another application of water-saving hydrogel in Uzbekistan. Secondly, our e-marketplaces have become a regular feature of ADB support for innovation, where solution providers present their latest digital technology and best practices towards increased awareness and evidence-based information to deliver smart, resilient, safe, and inclusive water management services. And we also run a, a twinning program 
through ADB's Water Operation Partnerships for Resilience, what we call our WAP for R program. This has been supporting water entities to improve uh, water service coverage and delivery, financial sustainability, and other aspects of their performance to become more sust sustainable and more resilient. So WAP for R is built upon the success and the les lessons learned from our earlier WAP program which was launched in 2007 and which has already benefited 21 countries. Next slide, please. So if you wanna find out how you or your organization can connect and collaborate with ADB and help build capacities of water entities towards a more resilient, sustainable, inclusive and water secure Asia and the Pacific, then please, connect with us via the website hubforr.adb.org or by email at hubforr.adb.org. Many thanks for connecting. Back to you, Alison. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff, to present some of those um, exciting initiatives that uh, ADB has recently launched to, to promote more collaboration in the water space. Um, before we move on to our uh, next speaker, I want to take another opportunity to put some uh, polls out to the audience to get your input into the and in participation in this session. So the next question is, if multi-stakeholder collaboration were a puzzle, what would be the three key pieces that need to fit together seamlessly for success? So what are those three key ingredients that you see as being critical for multi-stakeholder collaboration? Great, we're seeing some good responses, vision, trust, communication. Partnerships. I see another good one in the chat that someone's put, transparency. We have that up too on the slide. Openness is a good one. Context specific, respect, accountability. These are these are all great. Thank you. Thank you very much to our audience sir, for some great suggestions on, on what those key pieces of the puzzle um, need to be there for effective multi-stakeholder collaboration. Maybe we can move to our next, next question. Okay, what's the maximum number of stakeholder groups you can imagine working together on a project? I guess noting that it probably depends on the on the project and who your stakeholders are, but maybe based on your experience um, with collaborating with partners, what would you say would be the the maximum or ideal number? Okay, we're seeing. Four point five, or forty five. I guess multiples of ten. So we're seeing maybe around forty. That's yeah. I think that's already a huge number. I think for for those who can manage that many stakeholders effectively, well well done. So, okay. I think the poll oh seems to be hovering around forty. Great, okay, I think we can move on to our uh, next presentation. And maybe I'll just check, we're supposed to have Mr. Therawat uh, Sampha Wamana um, from the Mekong River Commission to give a presentation on MRC's proactive regional planning framework. So I'll just check, do we have Mr. Therawat here in the session? If not, maybe we can uh, move on and uh, come back towards the end and check whether he's been able to join the session. So 
if we don't have Mr. Therawatt, um, I would like to suggest uh, that we introduce uh, Sarah Ransom on Innovation Partnerships for Development. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Alison, and thanks to ADB for organising this session. Um, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to be really quick and I'm really happy to take any questions when we get back to the Q&A bit at the end of the session. First, I'll just acknowledge that I'm joining this meeting from um, Ngunnawal country in Canberra, Australia. Um, the Ngunnawal people are the traditional owners of the land that I work on, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So I'm going to take a slightly different take on this question. I'm going to talk about um, partnerships as an innovation in themselves. So I'll explain what I mean about that a little bit. So I actually believe, if we can go to the next slide, that the word um, partnership gets used a lot, but um, all kinds of different relationships are kind of caught up in this word that we use, partnership. And um, I guess my contention today is that um, all the relationships aren't necessarily partnerships. Partnerships isn't just a word that we can use to make us feel good about what we're doing, but there's actually a bit of science and technique to it. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit today. So I guess my contention is that um, doing partnerships well is an area of innovation in itself. Um, as I said, there's a whole lot of evolving practice and theory around how what partnerships are and um, how to build them and how to sustain them. So this is work that we try to pick up with and use um, in the Australian Water Partnership. Um, and for us, it means a way of working where everybody who's, who's involved in a partnership is able to bring their needs and their expectations, and importantly, their values to a discussion about how best to tackle water challenges collaboratively. And um, we find that innovation itself um, often emerges from this kind of a dynamic discussion. The, the partnership is not just about working together. It's also really characterised, I think, by things like trust, um, mutual respect and understanding and coming together in cooperative relationships in a spirit of respect and humility and equality. Um, so there we have partnerships up in the uh, in the SDGs there. So I think it's it's a big question for all of us. Let's move to the next slide. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about who we are. The Australian Water Partnership is an organisation that was set up by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. There are, there are funders um, and we aim to match Australian water management expertise with international development needs. So we work mainly in the Indo-Pacific region and our work is around building a water for development community um, in our region and beyond. So events like this today are really important to us. Um, you can see there on the slide um, a whole lot of logos. They're just a group of some of our partners. We have around 240 partners in our partnership at the moment, 240 Australian organisations, and we work with um, a group of really important regional organisations and also um, international partners like our very valuable relationship that we have with the Asian Development Bank. Let's move to the next slide, please. So I'll talk just a little bit about what we've learned and how does the AWP partnership model support innovation in the work that we're doing in partner countries. So one of the important things that I think we've started to do more of is um, use co-design approaches to first allow for partnerships and relationships to be built before a program of work is then agreed on and then rolled out. So in the way that we work, we have quite a lot of flexibility. We work with grants. Um, and we have the ability to move quickly, but probably actually more importantly, we have the ability to move slowly where that's what's um, required. And that gives us space to work with partners in a way that's um, a little more organic and we find really important. Complex problems such as addressing climate change through water management and being doing that in a way that's sensitive to things like gender equality and disability and social inclusion is not just a technical question. These issues require people from really different backgrounds and with different perspectives to work together to come up with collaborative, innovative and adaptive approaches. 
Um, innovation itself can also occur when you deliberately seek out fresh and sort of unconventional ideas for the design and delivery of projects and combine them with good evidence, science, and what we've learned from development practice elsewhere. So in our work, we've got to focus at the moment on um, trying to work a little bit more with traditional knowledge. Um, so um, that means that we've been experimenting with approaches that include local, traditional, Indigenous and gendered understandings of water resource management, land and soils, and um, even climate change adaptation. So an example of how that works sometimes um, is when uh, traditionally and culturally monitored key indicator species um, can be used and integrated into an early warning system where traditional knowledge can work alongside um, data from sensors and um, and the use of models. So that's happening more and more, and we think that's quite innovative. I'll just give you one other quick example from our work. We're also going to talk about utility twinning. Um, so we have a water utility improvement program, um, which twins Australian water utilities with partners in the Asia and Pacific region. And this is implemented with our partners, the Australian Water Association. So this program works on things like managing climatic extremes, wastewater management, improved asset management, um, identification of new technology opportunities and building lasting partnerships. But there's one in particular that I just wanted to highlight because um, we, the most innovative part of this entire program actually grew out of a chance conversation between human resources managers um, in two utility twins. Um, where they sat down and just started talking about how difficult difficult it was to um, find and support women workers through through the workforce, and there was a great exchange of experience there. And then this triggered a new piece of work, which is based on this storytelling approach, um, which really built um, more knowledge around how to support the role of women in the workplace and some of the strengths and the knowledge that they can bring to solving some of the big problems that were faced by the water utilities in question. Um, I'll go to the final slide. Um, and this is my team. This is us, the Australian Water Partnership. And I included this just to emphasise the importance of the people who are supporting the partnerships, the skills and expertise needed to manage challenging cross-sector and cross-cultural partnerships in water um, can be understated or overlooked. But um, I think in our team, we, we're really trying to build these skills. We have a lot of people working with us from different backgrounds, and we try to model working in partnerships across our team by practicing respect, listening to other perspectives, asking good questions, and being prepared to have uh, hard conversations and take on feedback. I'll finish there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah, for an excellent presentation. I really like what you said about, you know, partnerships aren't just uh, feel good kind of collaborations. There is a science and technique to, to that. And it's important to work towards that and, and um, have an evidence um, base to, to underpin that. Really good points. Next, um, I would like to, I see we have Mr. Therawat uh, Sampo uh, Mana uh, from the Mekong River Commission, who's now joined. So I would like to kindly invite him to give his presentation on Mekong River Commission Proactive Regional Planning Framework. Over to you, Mr. Therawat, thank you very much. Mr. Therawat, just want to make sure that you can hear us. Maybe we'll just give another few seconds maybe for you to fix your sound, your microphone, if that's the issue. Otherwise, perhaps we can skip over as well. Let's just give you a few seconds to see if we can troubleshoot the mic. If not, we'll we'll move to the next presentation and come back to you. Okay, maybe in the interest of time, we'll move on uh, to um, our speakers from Global Water Partnership. 
we have uh, Mr. Laurent Charles Tremblay Levesque and uh, Yumiko Usada to present on the IWRM Action Hub and Youth uh, and Young Water Professionals platform. So over to you, uh, Yumiko and Laurent Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as uh, we have been talking about the multi-stakeholder and partnership uh, for a uh, for a water secure world, uh, the GWDP is precisely that network that we have uh, global uh, partners in over 180 countries and over 3,500 uh, 3, partners around the world. So, so precisely to promote this. Now today, I'm introducing you our innovation to foster this partnership, and uh, which is the IWM Action Hub. What it is, is a global knowledge uh, platform which supports actors to implement integrated water resources management, IWRM, and to share the knowledge and expertise about the implementation and experiences. This hub has uh, three key uh, sec uh, components and sections, uh, the purpose which is the learning, to really like learn what is out there as a tool and resources, and to explore, exploring the cases from, from other parts of the world, and also to explore where you stand in the IWM scoring, and then to connect, connect with other practitioners. Next slide, please. I'm just showing you this, uh, uh, like a little bit of moving slide of our IWM Action Hub. So the first part of this learn is, uh, is primarily consists of this IWM toolbox, which I think many of you may know, the previous uh, GWDP's IWM toolbox, and, and which was on a web-based um, tool, and uh, it's an evolution from that. We've added more tools and it, uh, it made it much more interactive, which actually has links to more resources and learning opportunities and the case studies uh, really explaining and different IWM tools. And next slide, please. And uh, talking about this case study is to really, this links to the next component of this is to explore what is out there as an example of implementing those IWRM. And you can search them by countries, by regions, by themes. You can also submit your own case studies. And then you can also even compare different case studies. And then this, this section also has a, a potential to uh, curate your own profile compared to the others and so on. Next uh, slide, please. And finally, the last uh, component, which is to connect. So we have a, this opportunity, if you are registered as a user of this, your profile will appear on this, uh, on this map of the, of the network. And then you can see where people are joining to use this. And next slide, please. And then among the members, there is a possibility to create more specific communities of practice based on a different interest. So here is that you, you can join your community that you're interested in, or you can also create your own. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Lauren Shaw, to dive a little bit more into this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yumiko. And thanks, uh, Allison, and to the organizers of, of this session. Uh, so I'll be presenting two specific uh, community very briefly. Uh, the first one being the, out, uh, the Armenian drought management community. So if you can switch to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a platform that brings together 60 uh, key stakeholders that are concerned with drought management in Armenia. It brings together representatives from uh, different ministries, including of territorial administration, Ministry of the Economy, and several departments of the Ministry of Environment, including the Department of Hydro Hydrometeorological Institute, uh, Agrometeorology, and also the Department of Bi uh, Biodiversity. The objective of this community, if you can switch to the next slide, please is um, to enhance coordination and knowledge sharing amongst uh, different key public institutions that are involved in drought management, and then also to take uh, coordinated action in, in drought related issues in Armenia. Beside uh, state institutions, there are currently also researchers that are being invited to join uh, to the table and also bring their outside the box um, ideas. In terms of activities, if you can switch to the next slide, please. Uh, they have uh, currently put together a digital catalog of policy-related materials on drought in Armenia. They're conducted different surveys, organizing panel, panel discussions with different uh, national and international experts, and uh, they're also disseminating at the moment a uh, monthly drought bulletin. If you can switch to the next slide, please. 
the second example, and I'll be quick on this one as well, is the um, is our South Asia youth community. So this is a small community of 20 young water professionals coming from Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. They represent different backgrounds and organizations. So they work for government, uh, UN interns, independent consultants, assistant professors. Uh, and these members were initially part of what was uh, called the Youth Water Academy uh, that was organized by our Global Water Partnership Office in, in South Asia. And following the program, and if you can switch to the next slide, please. Uh, they wanted to continue this peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, so they launched this community of practice in order to uh, have a peer-to-peer -peer support network that provides connection among uh, young water professionals working in South Asia. And then also to enhance youth engagement and involvement in water-related decision-making. Next slide and ultimate one. Um, so as uh, so, the community is moderated by our youth coordinator in uh, in the regional water partnership office in in Colombo, uh, who is organizing together with members uh, different meetups, webinars, inviting guest lectures, and doing workshops. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Back to you, Allison. Great. Thank you so much to uh, Yumiko and Laurent Charles. I think it's amazing what you've managed to put together with the IWRM platform. 180 countries with. 300 and 3,500 partnerships. If you guys had done that poll that we showed on Mentimedia earlier, I think our average would have gone way up beyond 40 after seeing uh, the number of collaborations you've managed to put together through, through the hub and amazing to see how a digital platform can be used to connect uh, water um, practitioners around the world, particularly uh, youth. Um, so thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Uh, next, let's move to our Mentimeter um, poll and allow some, uh, put out some questions for the audience to get your feedback. So the first question is, which of the following is the most challenging for effective multi-stakeholder collaboration? Um, collaboration is not always easy, um, as many of you already know. So. Uh, we have the options accommodating multiple and op opposite perspectives and interests, not over overcomplicating and um, creating too many too many complex processes or outcomes, ensuring that all voices are heard, and um, prioritizing the same viewpoints over some viewpoints over others. It's great to see that we already have some responses. So fairly even distribution across the, the responses. But it looks like the, the, the lead uh, response or the lead challenge, the, the biggest challenges um, are around ensuring voices are all heard. And we heard today from our presentations how some of our, our speakers are working very hard to ensure a voice and representation from, from groups that are sometimes uh, traditionally been marginalized. Uh, we see responses around accommodating uh, multiple and opposite perspectives, which is never easy. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think this, yeah, some great, uh, some great feedback and, and responses. Great, so let's move on to our next presentation. We have um, from Imagine H2O, we have Anne-Marie Martin, and she'll be speaking on making water innovation more accessible in Asia and the Pacific. So over to you, Anne-Marie. Great, thanks, Allison. So yeah, I think Jeff gave a brief introduction earlier on our work with ADB, which is what I'll be focusing during my presentation today, which is essentially a collaboration model between ADB and Imagine H2O Asia that creates new opportunities for utilities, government agencies, and other key stakeholders to adopt innovative technologies. So just a really quick introduction on who we are first. Imagine H2O is a Singapore-based NGO with a mission to make water innovation more accessible in the Asia Pacific. And we support water tech entrepreneurs by designing and co-funding pilot projects in emerging markets. So since 2018, Imagine H2O has awarded nearly 2 million in direct pilot funding grants globally. Next slide, please. 
So last year, ADB and Imagine H2O Asia came together to launch the Accelerating Innovation and Digitalization Program, um, or AID, uh, which is a program that allows ADB to not just learn about the latest technologies in water, but also test these solutions in the field with their customers. So AID begins with identifying urgent problem statements by working closely with ADB project officers, um, matching them with Imagine H2O's vetted network of innovators, and then when there's problem solution fit and customer buy-in, that's when we begin the pilot design process. And so after they're completed, we document the results, we evaluate the commercial potential, and then we share these learnings with other, with other similar end users. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So our first aid project is in Bangladesh, um, in a city south of Dhaka, um, which was looking to use decentralized solutions to address gaps in water service delivery. So the solution provider of interest, in this case, a Bangladesh-based startup, they had more than 300 water ATMs operating in Dhaka city. And despite this, there were still barriers to bringing this solution to a neighboring city because the mayor wanted to test it in their community first and make sure there was local acceptance. This is very common in the region where the norm is question first and, and believe later. So through aid, we're deploying two water ATMs to gather local feedback for the mayor's office before exploring a commitment of 50 systems. And multiple players came together to help the city corporation facilitate uh, a trial and, and de-risk wider adoption. So ADB provided input on where these systems should be installed in order to address uh, the needs of lower income communities in the city. Uh, the solution provider secured commitment for the mayor's office and conduct, uh, conducted uh, initial customer surveys. And then later on, the city corporation will gather feedback from the communities who are actually using the ATMs. And finally, Imagine H2O, as a neutral player in this process, facilitated the project design and will now lead the monitoring and evaluation as the systems are um, underway. So you can see here that every partner has a distinct role in ensuring that the pilot succeeds and that the customer sees value in the solution before we consider a, a larger commitment. Next slide, please. So our second aid project is in Uzbekistan where we're testing a fully biodegradable hydrogel to help farmers reduce their water consumption and increase uh, their crop yield. Imagine H2O came in to introduce a vetted solution that had been developed and deployed across India. And we had identified alignment with an ADB project officer um, with an upcoming project in Uzbekistan where the, the project officer helped to verify the problem statement with the relevant government agency. And having the right local partner here is really key, especially when the startup is entering an unfamiliar market. So here the government agency allocated us land, identified the farmers who would be piloting the hydrogel, and they also dedicated staff to support farmer training and crop monitoring. And more importantly, all partners came together early on in the conversation uh, to discuss the solution scale up potential in Uzbekistan. This included discussing the startup's capacity to expand into a new market and also the roles and incentives of the government agency um, to share this new technology with farmers across the country if, if the pilot is successful. Next slide, please. So beyond aid, Imagine h is repeating these types of collaborations um, in other markets with partners like the World Bank, uh, Coca-Cola Foundation, and uh, the government of Singapore. And I wanted to highlight a few practical takeaways we've observed through our process. First is that demonstrating uh, value is a collaborative ongoing process throughout the pilot. You know, we need on the ground partners for troubleshooting and we also need external neutral parties uh, to help with project monitoring and evaluation. And then even if the pilot is technically successful, that doesn't mean that the customer has seen value yet. And this is where check-ins and debriefs throughout the pilot is really key to help understand what the customer's experience was. Second is that having transparency of everyone's interests and motives promotes trust early on. I know during the Mentimeter sessions, a lot of people raise this as an important factor. Um, and as an NGO, Imagine H2O uh, doesn't take equity from our startups. And this way, we're able to build trust with our partners because we're, we're not pushing technology onto end users. 
And our neutral position helps us to source primary data early on from the customer to design the right kind of intervention for them. Third is that it's essential to have open and continuous feedback from all stakeholders, especially the customer when it comes to post pilot planning. Um, and, and in this case, having, having an external party um, in place of the solution provider sometimes can allow for more candid feedback from the customer. And lastly, we've seen that targeted, well-designed grants can have an outsized impact in a project, especially when other stakeholders contribute their own resources um, through in-kind services or, or a cost-share model. Uh, but I'm happy to share more about these learnings in the Q&A session later, but that's all for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Anna-Marie. I think that's a, gr a great presentation in terms of imagine H2O's role as sort of the honest broker in in terms of vetting uh, innovative water technologies, and, and you're, you're really bridging, building that bridge by connecting MDBs like ADB with these innovative solutions providers and um, playing a really important role in terms of, I guess, uh, increasing the overall impact of uh, MDB operations by being able to infuse some of these really innovative solutions. So thank you very much. Okay, I think before we um, move to our last presentation, we'll have an, one more Mentimeter poll. So if I could please ask uh, Yang to pull that up. Thank you. Great. Um, so the next question is rank in order of difficulty, the primary challenges faced in multi-stakeholder collaboration. So some of the challenges include too many perspectives, interests, and ideas, too many cooks in the kitchen, uh, complex decision-making process, um, a forum to allow all voices and forming a non-homogenous solution. So we've got some responses coming in. Seems like some of the biggest challenges are around creating a forum to allow all voices, which is consistent, I think, with the responses from our last question. Um, trying to, yeah, too many <laughs> perspectives, interests, complex decision-making, I guess it's always challenging to get a resolution or get getting to agreement when you have a lot of interests and varying ideas. Great, okay, thank you very much. Let's move to our next question. In multi-stakeholder collaboration, what does synergy refer to? So what do you, what do you take or interpret as a synergy meaning when it comes to collaboration? Merging conflicting interests, combined efforts resulting in enhanced outcomes for everyone, accommodating all stakeholders or distribution of resources. And it seems like the, the response is pretty clear in the responses we have so far, 11 responses for combined efforts resulting in enhanced outcomes for everyone. Very interesting. Great. Okay. I think we can close this poll and um, let's see if we can move on to the next presentation. Um, because this session is all about collaboration, I do want to make sure I give space to Mr. Therawat to see if he's able, he's been able to um, resolve his technical issues and um, able to present the framework um, from the Mekong River Commission on proactive regional planning. So maybe I'll just see Mr. Therawat. The Hello, floor you is yours. Me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. That's great. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry again for the, uh, the problem with the internet system here. And um, uh, good morning, good. Afternoon, everyone. So uh, it is my pleasure to join the Stockholm World Water Week today as a speaker from the Mekong River Commission Secretariat and to share uh, our innovative work on the proactive regional planning conducted through a collaborative uh, process driven by the MRC's member countries and uh, related stakeholders. Next slide, please. Yes, and for your information that the proactive regional planning is an ongoing process that addresses the main challenges that the Mekong River Basin faces, including floods and droughts, erosion and sedimentation, water level fluctuations, degradation of 
environment and impacts of climate change. The proactive regional planning is the whole of basin planning that seeks to address regional water, food, and energy security. It brings together water, food, energy, and environment needs in an uh, integrated assessment process. The proactive regional planning assesses the benefits, costs, and trade off of water resource development and management planning scenarios. It identifies new supplementary investment project and enabling activities that have not previously been considered by the basin country. The ultimate goal is to develop an adaptive basin plan by 2027 through the strategic study, scenario assessment, and upgrade the decision support framework. One click, please. And uh, there are two key outputs that are targeted for this uh, proactive regional planning work. The first one is an upgrade the decision uh, support framework, which includes data repository, modeling and assessment tools, forecasting tools and operational capabilities. The second output is an adaptive basin plan that will include new supplementary investment project and also an enabling activities. The the adaptive basin plan will be supported by four strategic uh, study on storage options, hydrological limits for wetland, sediment transport, and water energy integration options. Furthermore, it will also be supported by uh, alternative development scenario formulation and assessment. Through the scenario assessment, a list of supplementary projects will be derived for the adaptive basin plan. Next slide, please. And the project regional planning is a country-driven process conducted through rigorous stakeholder engagement process. In order to ensure acceptance by the member countries, this engagement process includes the consultation with member countries throughout the PRP process through national and regional meetings. The consultation with other stakeholders will be through the MRC Regional Consultation Forum and relevant meetings, and the engagement with the upper Mekong countries also will be conducted through the data sharing and conduct the joint study. So this is just in brief for the, my presentation on the proactive regional planning of the MRC. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really interesting presentation. I think. Uh, Mekong River Commission uh, does an amazing job of collaboration with your diverse um, members and, and interests and, and balancing, as you say, the water, food, energy nexus issues that, that arise and, and using that energy, uh, that information base around data sharing and, and joint studies. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. Um, I see we have about eight minutes for the session, so maybe we'll move to allow more time for Q&A. We'll just have one more quick poll? Maybe one more poll question and then we'll we'll open up the floor for questions. Okay, so final question. Uh, rank in the order of importance the following factors for successful multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, number one, clear, open, and um, consistent communication, shared vision and goals, flexibility and adaptability, strong leadership, trust among stakeholders. So it seems like trust among stakeholders is coming up along with shared vision and goals as some of the most important factors for success in multi-stakeholder collaboration. Also clear, open and consistent communication is also coming up. It seems like actually uh, many, I think all of the choices have been identified as, as being important. Um, but yeah, it seems like share of vision and goals, clear, open and consistent communication are, are coming up as the, as the top two. So we'll close the poll. Thank you very much. And maybe we'll move on to questions and taking some questions from our audience. So maybe just looking through the questions. Um, Maybe the first question I will give to um, 
Anne-Marie, a question relating to the pilot projects that you mentioned. What are some of the challenges you faced with the pilot projects? I mean, you're doing this amazing job of bringing very diverse stakeholders together. MDBs work very differently from, say, uh, small startups. How, how do you bridge those uh, relationships and effectively implement those pilots? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think one challenge is definitely, you know, aligning on priorities and expectations of the pilot. And this is often a very like time intensive process. And in order to demonstrate value, we need to make sure that the customer understands value the same way that we do. And this is what we mean, like in the poll, again, it's having, making sure there's that shared vision, right? And how we do this, um, how we address this challenge is first by trying to get written uh, evidence of customer buy-in. So this can be through like an LOI or an MOU early on before we approve the projects. And then also making sure, again, that we build in like feedback throughout the entire pilot implementation process so that we have that constant direct channel with the customer to hear uh, what challenges they're facing as well and how we can troubleshoot. And then another challenge really quickly is just making sure that the customer remains engaged throughout the process so that the innovator gets the best chance um, of success. And this can be overcome through working with neutral players like ADB who can, um, who can create a sense of urgency sometimes and have that influence with the customer if needed when there are um, delays or when the, when the pilot project stalls. And you know other elements like finding trusted local players, local, um, local partners, um, that can help facilitate the monitoring and implementation of the project. This is especially important um, in cases when there's a language barrier between um, the startup and the market uh, that, they're that they're deploying in. And finally, just during the post-pilot debrief, um, we want to make sure we have the right stakeholders in the room. And again, this is where players like ADB can play a big role in bringing in um, um, other stakeholders into the room, not just the pilot customer, but potential um, uh, other potential stakeholders that would be interested in the outcomes of the pilot, and they can help like bring this to other similar utilities or, or agencies. Great, thanks very much, Anne Marie. Okay, we'll try and fit in. I know we only have four minutes left, but maybe a couple, one, one, at least one more question, maybe two, if we can squeeze it in. Um, I uh, see a question uh, for Sarah from the Australian Water Partnership. Um, I think the examples you uh, gave in terms of, you know, the efforts you've made to really um, bring in uh, groups like women, people with disabilities, indigenous uh, people into, um, into the collaboration space and really working with them, giving them a voice and a platform to, to work with um, you on water issues um, is, is, um, is really important. Can you talk about maybe some of your experiences and, and good practices around that? Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. And um, I really don't want to give the impression um, in speaking about this that it's um, necessarily always very um, easy to bring different stakeholder groups around the table. I think it's challenging at times. And I think um, we would do ourselves a disservice if we said that it was always easy to do. It's good to just acknowledge that um, people come to this space with different expectations and different ways of working. So... Um, yeah, having said that, I think throughout the years, AWP has um, collected some, some good experience. Um, as I said in my presentation, I do think a lot of, I guess, the secret sauce for us in working in partnership is being flexible. Um, and I really think that... Um, some collaborations, particularly where you're working across a number of different um, spaces. Sorry, that's my son. There we go. This is our mum life. Apologies. Um, where you're working across different spaces with different stakeholders, um, you need more time. So you need to invest uh, more time in building relationships and really um, understanding not just who's bringing money to the table and um, what needs to happen in a technical sense, but really what kinds of other assets and strengths um, are in the partnership and, and those can really um, create a great collaboration over time. So I'll just stop it there. 
Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think, um, yeah, really valuable lessons, I think, for, for all those looking to, to build those coalitions and um, improve collaboration. We have one more minute. So I think, um, unfortunately, we probably don't have time to put any further questions out to the um, to the speakers, but I just want to take this opportunity to close the session and to thank all of our speakers. I think um, you've given us uh, really good perspectives on sharing what you're doing um, to improve collaboration in the water space for, for improved development impact and given us uh, a lot of good examples, case studies, food for thought, also um, been honest in that it's not always easy and you know there are challenges along the way, but if with, with perseverance and as we heard from the polls today and hearing uh, inputs from the audience with shared vision, with trust, um, accountability, good communication, that collaboration does work well and can, we can achieve um, a lot more when we work together. As the, pro as the proverb goes, if you wanna walk fast, walk alone, but if you wanna walk far, walk together. So with that, I'll close today's session and thank you very much as well to our very interactive audience for, for joining us today and contributing to, to our poll questions. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Bye. Thank Bye. You.